Hey guys, welcome to the Quiggin' Out MMA podcast. I almost forgot the name of my own show tonight. <laughs> so we are on episode six, and as you can see, my two guests tonight are Bellator Cutman Matt Marston and his wife, Dr. AJ Marston. How we doing, guys? Uh, good, how are you? Not too bad. You know, we're all staying safe, staying away from everybody, so <laughs> that's all we can say. <laughs> but um, I wanted to talk to you guys, you know, Matt, you and I have been talking for years. I've had the pleasure of, you know, getting to meet you in person, you too as well, AJ. And I wanted to talk about kind of your history because you guys have way more of an interesting history than I think anybody really knows about <laughs> how you met and your, um, where you got started. So I kind of want to start out with, you know, how you met and where you met because I know the answer, but I think everybody else would be surprised to find uh, out. So we met at Fort Sam Houston down in San Antonio. Uh, we were both stationed together. Uh, we were army medics uh, there, and that was where we were in school at the time. <clears throat> so we actually weren't supposed to be dating. Uh, no. Students weren't supposed to date, <laughs> but uh, we did it anyway. But yeah, we were we were 18 when we met, yeah. and we've been together ever since. So what was, what was our... Uh, we met in 99. Yeah. So our anniversary, actually, what's it going to be... How many years? Uh, 14, something? No, 18. 18? Right? I was going to say a lot more than that. I think it's 18 years. I think it's 18 years. years. Uh, it's, uh, it's in two weeks, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got a big surprise you know, for, of course, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, obviously. Yes. Yeah. Obviously. Now, now I do. He was supposed to be <laughs> now that we put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was supposed to be in yeah. London, so. So it's actually kind of nice because now he's going to be home. So. <laughs> Even better. So why did you join the Army? Uh, I just had nowhere else to go. I, I knew I, I wasn't like at that time, I'm uh, like ready to go to college and it seemed like a good way to pay for college anyway. So that's why I joined up. Mm. <clears throat> yeah. Same reason. My parents basically told me if you want to go to college, you're going to have to pay for it. And you know, I was working at a factory when I was in high school, so I wasn't really making bank. Mm -hmm. uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, well, this will be a way to have my college paid for for me, uh, which yeah. they did pay for like the first two years, which was really yeah. nice. Yeah. So, and mine too. Like, yeah. and they gave us a lot of, uh, you know, when we were in the army, we both uh, initially went the medical route and that gave us a lot of schools and certifications and licenses that helped us as civilians. So we, we kind of had a, a good army experience that we got a lot of college kind of out of the way, just on the job. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I mean, I guess that's the best way to go. And there are so many people who run that route where they're like, you know, they end up in the workforce they don't necessarily want to join the military. They're usually a little reserved. Um, I know when I was a kid, I wanted to be a sniper um, just because I played video games. And then I learned that right. that's not how it works. Oh, we wanted to be Rambo, you know, like, yeah, James Bond. <laughs> like nobody, nobody joins the army and goes, I really want to be a cook. That's like, that's, <laughs> that's really what I want to do. You know, everybody thinks that they're going to be Rambo. And some do. My, um, my battle buddy, that's, uh, so when you join, you get a, in basic training, you get a partner mm -hmm. that you're supposed to kind of look out for each other. And that's called your battle buddy. And I still talk to mine to this day. Um, and that's he awesome. did end up becoming Rambo. He was also a medic at first. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he went back to school. Uh, he became a reservist. He went back to school and got his bachelor's degree, then re-entered active duty as an officer mm -hmm. and went infantry, ranger school, airborne school. Uh, he just retired from active duty as a major, and he's about to be promoted to lieutenant colonel in a reserve unit. But in his spare time, he went ahead and joined the FBI, and he's now an <laughs> FBI agent up in uh, Baltimore. So, you know, like, <clears throat> he, he really did go on to become Rambo, so. That's the craziest thing ever. Like, who just in their free time is like, you know what, I want to join the FBI. That sounds like a yeah. good idea. Yeah. No. Like he, he, like it's better than tours to Iraq, and I was like, well, I, I guess, but it's also Baltimore, so no. <laughs> <laughs> to any of our Baltimore listeners, um, I can't defend you at all. I've never been there. They know your time. Although uh, I had, uh, so the whole time he was at the FBI Academy, I was busting on him about uh, Johnny Utah, calling him Johnny Utah, and making point break jokes. <laughs> and uh, he comes out and he goes you know, I just got my training officer or whatever assigned to me. And he goes, and you know what the first thing we're learning is? And I was like, I don't know what. And he goes, bank robbery. He goes, I'm going right into bank robbery for my first thing. <laughs> and I was like, oh. Oh, that's perfect. That's going to follow him forever. You know that, right? Yeah, like a script. <laughs> so you're in the Army. You guys meet, obviously fall in love. You know, it's, it's, you know, one of those stories where not a lot of people meet in the Army. 
Like, not as much as you'd think. You know, it's probably a lot more than we know, but... Not, not soldier to soldier. A lot of people get married in the Army, but not to mm-hmm. soldiers. It's really hard to, to navigate, the, especially the, you know, not so much the deployments, but just, you know, your, your regular duty stations a lot of times can be split. We were just lucky that, you know, every place we went had two open slots, <laughs> you know, every time. So... Well, it seems like it was meant to be there, so. Yeah. But we knew other people that were married to soldiers that were split up for months at a time during temporary duty stations and stuff like that. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it was always pretty hard on them. We were lucky to not have to deal with that so much. Yeah. It sounds like it. So how do we go from Army medic to professor at a college or professor at a university Mm -hmm. if we want to be official? I think it it was an assistant professor. Yes. And then... Cut man for Bellator. So we'll start with AJ because, yeah, <laughs> it's easier. Okay. <laughs> um, well, basically, you know, we, we were in the Army and we were working in the operating room for a while. And, and I just knew that I did not want to do that for the rest of my life. Um, so I went back to school and then I just kind of kept <laughs> staying in school. <laughs> I was doing really good. Um, and then I got interested in psychology and I just went that route. Um, so I got my PhD and uh, now I teach at a great college. So it's a small liberal arts, um, school in Leesburg and we specifically service students who have learning disabilities. So all of my students are very diverse. They come from awesome backgrounds. They're really, it's a good, it's a good place. And that's an amazing thing to do. And I know that you studied IO psych and you were one of the only people in the world I ever met that knew what that was, let alone worked in that field. So I think we kind of had that connection right there. So that was really cool because I just remember going, she knows what? Like she actually (laughs) knows about this because it was the smallest section in the book about jobs. It was the niche market. It was, you know, it was that thing. And then shift over to Matt, you end up as a cut man working your way through everything. So kind of walk us through, you know, how you got to where you are today. So when we when we first got out of the army, we actually continued to work together um, in the same operating room. Uh, basically, she worked in room two and I worked in room three right next to each other. We did that for five years. Uh, and then whenever she went full time uh, to school, um, I got a job as the director of uh, Mid-America Transplant, which is the, at the time it was the largest freestanding tissue bank in the world. And... <clears throat> That's a that's a job that you can get burnout on really really quick, mm. and uh, one of the things that I was I was doing to kind of get through that was I was getting really really back into martial arts. Um, it was something I had done for a long time before, but I got busy with life and kind of put it down. And it was something I was doing to get myself back up again. Mm-hmm. And then uh, <clears throat> while I was training, my coach there, Mike Rogers, was putting on a charity show called GIs versus Joes. And it was all the soldiers from Fort Leonard Wood coming up to fight amateurs or in the St. Louis area. And so he's like, I don't have any money to pay a cut, man, but you're a nurse, right? You can do it. And I was like, <laughs> uh, sure. So like I had seen it on TV and I, you know, I, I knew a lot, a lot about, you know, the, the entering stuff, but I didn't really know much about wrapping hands at the time. And that was, you know, a big part for me to learn. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, <clears throat> I was then just kind of doing it regionally, just kind of getting my feet wet. And I got lucky enough to uh, be at the right place at the right time in Miami, Oklahoma. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't screw up so bad, I guess, because they kept inviting me back. And then I survived the, uh, you know, the Bjorn Scott, you know, switch, mm-hmm. luckily, and actually ended up with a promotion out of it. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> and now here we are. Well, and, and like you said, you right place at the right time. It seems like that's been a motif for you in your life. You know, you guys meeting at the Army, they're always being two spots open. That stuff yeah. doesn't just happen by chance. So that was that was really set for you. So I love that you, you know, you worked that grind. And like you said, right place, right time. And you didn't screw it up. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, when you get, you know. You get the opportunity. Yeah, you, you got to it. You got to capitalize on it. You know, that's the thing. I think a lot of people um, sometimes fail to realize that a fair amount of their problems might be from failing to capitalize on opportunities because they were afraid. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people are afraid to take that leap. I was afraid to take that leap. You know, it was my first televised show and it was going to be on MTV too, which at the time was, you know, decent network still. They had, uh, and they had a big MMA following because they had bully beatdown and stuff. Oh God. You know, I knew (laughs) people I I know were going to see me Mm -hmm. and, you know, but you can't, can't sit there and go, what if, (laughs) you know, oh. You know, no, I, I was too afraid. But I, I even, I privately told people, I was like, no, I'm going to fuck this up. I'm sorry, I don't even care. No, you, can, like, you can say whatever you want. Yeah. I was 100% sure I was going to screw the pooch. And I had some work that night. That was, if I remember right, Dave Rickles' debut. And he came out of there uh, like a axe murderer, you know, covered in blood that night. So, <laughs> like, it was a heavy audition for sure. But you just got to be ready when the time comes. And, and you got to be patient. You know, at the same time, wait for the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. So it was funny because while you were telling that story, AJ was like shaking her head like, yes, yes. He was. What was going through (laughs) your head when he was like, yeah, I'm going to go do this? Well, I think I was more terrified for him just because he seemed so unsure of himself. I was like, I was trying to, you know, make him feel confident in himself. I was like, you got this. You can do this. You're a nurse. You've been doing this for so long. You worked in the emergency room. I mean, come on. You could do this. And he's like, I don't know if I could do this. And I was like, no, you got this. <laughs> so I'm like trying to be his cheerleader while inside I'm like terrified for can, him. Can he do this? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I don't know if he can do this. <laughs> he's really scared. <laughs> The first night, what was the scariest part for you? Was it the anticipation after to be like, did did I not wrap hands right? Did I or at that point were you established enough with, you know, by the end of the night you were like, you know what, I did everything right and I, I'm good. Um, no, I was not confident. Like I don't think that I screwed anything up that night. Mm-hmm. Um, as a matter of fact, I know I didn't because <laughs> Dean Lapp later, you know, told me like, yeah, you didn't screw anything up, and uh, but. I was I was still not sure. Um, I was most afraid of the TV stuff, actually. Um, and by that, I mean, like, I had never worked in any kind of television setting before. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and, and there was it was intimidating. That was a small show back then, but all the cameras and the cords and the lights and, like, you have to, you know, the blocking and everything. Mm-hmm. You know, I had done some, like, theater stuff in high school, so I knew, uh, like, a few basics about, like... A little bit. Yeah, but literally that much. <laughs> but, you know... Uh, like it was just that was the overwhelming part i was afraid that i was going to make mistakes in that and you know what early on i did you know if you go back and you watch some of those early bella tours you will see me bumping into a lot of stuff <laughs> <laughs> knocking over camera people and like it was it was bad but uh you know just like anything i learned you know and now it's i don't, I don't even notice it and it's such a big change going from like a small show which he was doing regionally mm-hmm. and then to more- big shows where all of a sudden there are cameras and there are cords going everywhere and you're like oh my gosh i'm gonna trip over something i'm gonna make a total ass of myself on live television yeah, <laughs> yeah. well it's like yeah. you go to the some of the regional shows they've got the handheld camcorder there's no lines there's no so i've dealt with that too where the next thing you know you're ass to elbows with another photographer or another yes. like you said you know the camera is trying to get by and you're like i'm focused on this area right here this little spot, I'm not looking at anything else around me. And you kind of have to be aware of everything that's going on. So I get, I know how that feels. I've, I've bumped into my share of people too. So. Well, and you know, one thing that came along with that was realizing that it wasn't always me screwing up. <laughs> you know, we had this one particular camera person who I always seemed to, to run into uh, while I was working in between the corners. And I always thought that it was me not somehow signaling that, that I was going to stand up or that I was going to move. Mm-hmm. And then later on that, that camera person's uh, no longer with us and uh, they were replaced with someone else who I've never run into once. I was like, oh, it was their fault. It wasn't me, <laughs> it was them, they just sucked. <laughs> okay, well that actually made me feel better. <laughs> Do you guys have hand signals like, hey, I'm coming up or? Well, so realistically, a good camera person who's trying to get in, so if I'm down in front or she's down in front, they're usually coming in kind of over the top of us, like Mm -hmm. in a downward angle towards the fighter's face. So Mm -hmm. I'm working up. So a good camera person is listening for the seconds out clacker, okay? And that's when they start to pull their shot back and get out of the way. Mm -hmm. But uh, that other particular camera person never paid attention to that. And so whenever it was like, everybody has to get out and everybody stands up suddenly, as we always do, Mm -hmm. they were always just right there getting knocked around. So 
But like, yeah, I, I realized later I talked to one of the camera people, Duke, actually Duke Thorne, who is I think probably the greatest like action camera guy out there right now. He does like the World Series and Super Bowl too. And we're lucky enough to have him on our show. That's pretty awesome. Um, man. That he was the one that told me, he's like, oh no, I'm listening for that clacker. So that I realized that you're about to stand up. And I was like, you son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought you were good at it. You're just actually listening to what's going on. Yeah. <laughs> so you brought up the good point of AJ now doing cut man. And we, I don't know if we're, do we call it cut woman? Is, is the term still cut man? I, you know, I think cut man is fine. I'm not going to be picky about it. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, fine. And how did that come about? Obviously with Matt doing everything he does, but how did you decide or how did they decide to be like, you know what? Let's make them a duo again, because it seems to be, again, your, your M.O. Well, it's funny you say that again, because whenever I was coming up on the regional scene, like, she worked with me then. I did, um, yeah. So, like, it wasn't something completely... I'm sorry. This is, <laughs> we're just going to move the cat out of the way there. <laughs> uh, so she had worked with me before for quite a while, and then... Um, you know, her practice and everything picked up. And, and at Bellator, we had kind of an established team and I didn't work regional shows as much. So mm -hmm. it just wasn't yeah. there, but yeah. we just got busy. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, then karate combat came up. Yeah. And that and, was here in, in Florida. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that was just kind of a, things had kind of settled down at work and Matt's like, well, you want to start doing this again? And I'm like, you know what? It feels right. The timing feels right. Yeah. And then uh, she was, already going to be in Japan with me and I only needed one other person. So there she was, but she's worked actually uh, several Bellator shows. People I think maybe just haven't noticed, but she's worked all the Hawaii shows and she's worked several Mohegan shows. And then mm -hmm. of course the Japan shows and yeah. yeah, she's like actually in there quite a bit these days. <laughs> well, yeah. And before it was like the first time, you know, getting to see if they like, where are they going to show Matt? And it was the, the camera people start to kind of learn who they put on camera and who they don't as far as like what works so i you're right noticing the the bellator hawaii cards i started to see aj a lot more and i was like oh my god like there she <laughs> is like yeah so and she's good too <laughs> so, like legit i had a good teacher so that helps i don't know who that was so. yeah. well we'll have to find them one day and uh figure yeah. out what they <laughs> i think she just oh, watched a lot you. of youtube videos <laughs> you know <clears throat> well and in, in the day and age like everything we're living through like youtube is amazing oh yeah when people can yeah. use it to its potential i'm not saying go do a heart surgery after watching youtube but well like the other day i needed to change the starter on my jeep mm -hmm. right it was a four minute youtube video and i had it done like that easy i'd never done it before on any vehicle and yeah it was literally that easy after one youtube video so like it's a great resource well, it's easier on the Jeep. The Jeep's higher up, too. <laughs> it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was stupidly it easy. easy on that Jeep. It was. It's literally right under the driver's side wheel well. You don't even need to, like, you need it. You just need, like, one socket wrench and a screwdriver. And it took, like, it took about as long as that video. It took about four minutes. See, so. and that's, that's amazing because from this, you've learned something. Yep. Because changing a starter at the mechanic, what are we talking, a few hundred dollars probably? At least. Yeah. At least for something that also would have taken them four minutes. Yeah, so. but it, your car would have been there for like three days. But you know, <laughs> exactly. So talk about the traveling aspect of it because not many people get to travel for their work and actually enjoy it. And I mean, some of the stuff that um, you know you guys have shot, some of the people you've been with, like talk about those experiences and those those things that aren't caught on the camera, like the fun stuff. AJ smiling from ear to ear right now. <laughs> what? Uh, well, I mean, I love to travel. I love to experience new cultures. I love to meet new people. Um, Matt is like, he, he also enjoys it, but I, he gets more exhausted by it. Like I love to extend our Bellator trips and, um, and go to additional places and be like, okay, we're in Japan, you know, let's also go over here and let's go do this and do that. And he's like, wait, 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 wait. we're already going to be gone for two weeks. Like we don't need to be gone for a month. We have cats. Yeah. <laughs> I like that I that's thought... your excuse. You're like, we have cats. <laughs> <laughs> we have cats. We have cats. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I do like to travel, but you you know me. I'm, I'm a bit of a homebody in general. So mm -hmm. I, I, I don't mind the travel, but whenever it stacks like that, it can start to get really tiring for me. Mm 
Mm. Um, but like I like my perfect travel schedule, like my ideal would be every other week, home a week on the road a week, home a week on the road a week. I'd be fine with that. Mm -hmm. But sometimes I'm home five or six weeks and then I'm out eight weeks in a row, you know, and that's when it gets like, it's exhausting. Yeah. Well, that would get exhausting for anybody. It doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. And I mean, now you're, how long have you been a cut man for Bellator specifically? Uh, I actually just since 2013, I believe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Hold on. I actually, oh, I actually, I actually just texted this to someone the other day <laughs> uh, <laughs> because they asked and I was like, Oh, uh, Oh, 2011, October of 2011 was my first show with Bellator. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So nine years, um, this October. Yeah. That's crazy. Bellator 53 in Miami, Oklahoma. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, when, in when he tent. first started, <laughs> yeah, when he first started, they were going. What was it? Twelve weeks on, twelve oh, weeks off. That was a brutal schedule. But you know, it's it's funny because those of us that are still around that had that schedule, like we really like we <laughs> kind of miss it. We kind of miss the brutality of it. You know, it's <laughs> it, it, it's like. I don't know. You're just like, yeah, you think this sucks. You should have had the old schedule. We're like crotchety old men. Because under that schedule, we were out eight weeks in a row, home for a week, and then out four more weeks. Jeez. Uh, and then we would drop for three months to one show a month. That was uh, June, July, and August. We would just do one show a month. Mm-hmm. And then we would pick back up again, eight weeks out, one week off, four more, and rinse and repeat. And And that got rough because we were out from – on those those weeks that we were out, if you got to go home, you only got to go home for a day. Jeez. You know, basically do laundry and come right back. Yeah, yeah. it was so, rough. And those, we weren't going to the best spots then. So no. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the B shows, like going to those places. Like you said, it's not everybody's gonna have that argument about UFC, Bellator, whatever, but it's like the community and everything you guys have brought out over the last few years, you know, the Please bring back the tournament. I really do like it. <laughs> I know it was harder on the, I like the tournaments too. Um, I like. I think we're getting getting better for sure about the tournaments yeah. and like having them move Maybe a little try. faster. At least yeah. that was the goal. Well, <laughs> you know? and, and that was and the so, issue before. They were a little too too spread out. Yeah, they're a little too spaced out. But I think this new uh, this new deal with uh, CBS Sports is going to be good for us. And I think that. They're gonna. They're probably gonna be able to help us a little bit with our pacing and some of our like broadcast scheduling. I think that they're gonna be a big help there. Well, I think <clears throat> pacing is one of the most important things that's overlooked with a lot of organizations, UFC included, because there are times where you're like, "All right, you guys Man, have to forty think minutes since the last fight, guys. Come on, yeah." yeah. <laughs> or you have three title fights. You have to think that there's a possibility that all three could go the full twenty five minutes. Nice. So. Mm-hmm. We dealt with that yep. recently, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I miss fights. Um, you know, there was a time where it was like, there's too much, there's too many fights on and it's, it was hard to follow, you know, yes. and I liked the, the Friday night Bellator, you know, there was a Saturday UFC, but then it was like, then there's the Thursday night PFL and there was this and that. And you're like, I, I don't know what to watch. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. How have you seen it really grow? Um, since your time in Bellator, so like, just to keep in mind, like, my first Bellator event was Bellator '72 in Tampa. <laughs> yeah, okay. I was at that show. I remember that Jody Vitapo was on that show. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he got knocked out on that one. I remember yeah. that one specifically. Um, <laughs> the Sundome actually didn't let some of us in until the first fight had ended. I remember that. I remember <laughs> that being a thing. Bjorn was really angry about that. Like, that's the sort of stuff he did kind of notice, and he was pissed. Yeah. I remember um, walking in and they're like, all right, this is the second fight. And I went, what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what? so What's stupid. happened? And we only sold like a thousand tickets to that show anyway. It was an empty arena. Mm-hmm. It's not like we didn't need the people in there. Yeah, so. they, they closed off the, the second level at one point and we're just like yeah. pushing people down, like go sit down there, go sit down there. Yeah. So, um, But Bellator's growth has been, has been interesting um, because – it's funny, like our product has grown so much, but the actual size of our company hasn't. Mm-hmm. You know, you look at the number of people that are full time employees of Bellator right now, and you compare that to Bellator back when Bjorn was there. I would actually, there might actually be less <laughs> of us wow. now. 
um, we, as we've grown, um, we've been able to really utilize a lot of our relationships with like Viacom and their outlets in order for Bellator to keep the control, I think, pretty tight to the core group of people that really are, you know, mindful of the product like Scott. Mm -hmm. Um, so we haven't, we haven't gotten that exponential growth, kind of like UFC having hundreds and hundreds of employees just all over the place. You know, it's kind of too many, you know, they have a really toxic culture over there. I'm not afraid to say that. I mean, I don't think anybody that works there would disagree with me. They have a really toxic culture at the UFC. Mm -hmm. And I think that by kind of keeping it the way that we have, um, been not really growing in that, that way, I think it's better personally because we don't really have that culture. We're too, we're too close to each other, you know, whereas, you know, the, in the UFC, like, they might be in different cities, you know, smack talking each other like that. <laughs> you know, <clears throat> yeah, we don't really have that. No, no, you guys are all really tight. And they, you know, you, you guys have, like, open communication, lots of transparency. So if they're a great group of people to work with. And, I, and that's yeah. what I was going to ask, just, you know, coming from the outside. Like you said, you've been working some shows, but not doing it in the capacity that Matt has. So you've really been able to see how they, you know, welcome in somebody new um, yes. that they all know. <laughs> so um, I think and it's the, super exciting. Yes, it's, it's great. The, the Cutman that he put together, they all, when I started doing more shows, they were all really welcoming and they were all encouraging. They're all giving me tips on how to be better, <laughs> which is amazing. So they're willing to like share their knowledge with me. It's really great. And so I wanted to kind of go back because you did mention this earlier and we didn't really touch on it. You said when, when Scott came over, you actually got promoted. I did. <laughs> uh, so, so talk about how so, that happened. <laughs> I mean, I don't really know. It came from Scott. Um, we, I mean, Scott's around, but I don't talk to, to Scott a lot. It's not that I can't. It's just he's a busy guy and I really don't want to waste his time with bullshit. Um, <laughs> so when he first came on, um, he watched the uh, just a season like he didn't do anything. It was him and I believe Rich Chow and Carrie uh, Anna. They just came in and said, OK, everybody on staff just run this 12 week season like you would run a 12 week season. And we just want to watch and see how things work. And that's what they did. And then at the end of that 12 week season, uh, which I think was actually ooh, just right before Christmas, <laughs> the uh, that's when things started like really happening and that was when all the pieces got moved if you were being let go it was kind of around that time that that happened um anybody changing positions etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm -hmm. and then so yeah it was uh it was a weird switch because dean lasseter went from being my boss to us switching but he was really cool about it and we just didn't make it awkward it didn't really change the dynamic or the relationship because like there just wasn't, I mean, like he does a job. I don't get in my guys shit very much. I mm -hmm. guess I should say like, I trust them to make good decisions and just keep me in the loop. So there's really not much to being their boss. It's really just more of an, almost an administrative role about making assignments <laughs> and doing Excel spreadsheets and being the one that has to like chase somebody down for like a license or a social security number for a paycheck or something, you know, it's like, it's more stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Uh, the people I put together, they're all independent and good. I would trust any of them to work of like on me. You know what I mean? So uh, I mean, that's wow. Like I trust any decision that they make that they're gonna make the right decision anyway. And that includes my European crew. Mm -hmm. They're a great group of a group of guys too, and they work together uh a lot <clears throat> because they're also the main group for ACA. Mm -hmm. Uh and so they travel uh with them all the time as well. And I mean, that's pretty cool. So how much power, you know, control did you have over your team? Um, you know, with the guys or were they already um, really in place? Yeah, like I can choose, I, I pick and choose, you know, uh, and I just basically, because uh, we're all project-based employees uh, on that end of things. So I just basically let Bellator know who's going to be working each show. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we have, you know, the proper tax paperwork. But yeah, it's just an email I send uh, the week of the show, letting them know who the staff's going to be, but it rarely, rarely changes. But from time to time, it does change based on region. Mm -hmm. um, you know, sometimes I have people that I use in different spots. Um, and then it can also change based on availability. Like one of my cutmen, his full-time job is he's the foreman of the Orange County Fairgrounds, mm -hmm. uh, which is a huge job. But every year during the OC Fair, uh, he the entire month of July, he is not available. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, you know, I have, you have to work around stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> but I think that's pretty cool that you, you know, you're taking into consideration that, that kind of scheduling because, you know, you could talk about the fighter pay situation all day long, you know, and some people I'm not asking for disclosures on pay, but, you know, some people have a job and this is their, their other thing, just like with AJ, you know, yeah. like you said, wanting to get back mm-hmm. into it, almost like an escape or a different perspective on life. Um, going back into that because it was something you did before you enjoyed it. You wanted to do yeah. it again, you know, yeah. being in the role that you are, like you said, it's, it's a challenging position, you know, being a professor of any school, you know, teaching any kids doesn't matter. Um, it's not an easy job and I'll commend you for that too. Um, because we need the people like you in those roles who really care about the children who really care about the job and are not there to just, you know, get through the day and go home and do it all over again. So sorry, I went off on a little tangent there. But... <laughs> <laughs> so with all the traveling, what's the the most interesting place you think you've been? Um, and it can be different places. And I like every time AJ's like, what are you going to say? What are you going to say? <laughs> well, I know what she would say. What would I say? Oh, well, wait, did you actually? Uh, she loves Poland. I know that. She like, Krakow like specifically. Yeah, yeah. Krakow is gorgeous. Yeah. Okay. yeah, like that would be my guess. If we were like playing like the, what was that? The, the dating new, game? Yeah, the new thing. <laughs> <new, laughs> uh, <clears throat> Oh, I'm so disappointed, though. That's not what I would put. Oh, shit. <laughs> Failed. We lose a lot. You control the weather, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it would obviously be a trip with you. Oh, well, just, I mean, you're travel. I'm not going to put words in your mouth. If, if it's the, I mean, just because I wasn't there doesn't mean it wasn't incredibly cool. Because... It was. It was <laughs> but, cool. but at the same time, you're like, I know what she would pick. So you kind of put it on yourself there. All right, so what is it then? The Edinburgh. Oh, Edinburgh. Edinburgh. That was a really good trip. trip. She tried to break her ankle on the way out of the airport just to stay. Uh, Okay, no, no, no. We're going to stop. How how was (laughs) it? It was just wet. I fell on the stairs. (laughs) (laughs) Like, literally, as we were checking out of the hotel, (laughs) we were checking out to go to the airport, and she just, like, cracked her ankle. Oh, like, oh, yeah. God. So then we had, what, 24-hour travel all the way home. Luckily, oh, I had on these compression Nike running shoes. Yeah, it was great. And so it just I just didn't take off my shoes the whole time. <laughs> 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 but you're good. Um, like, geez, yeah, yeah, what a memory. I, you're like, I remember how great that was. I almost broke my ankle. <laughs> <laughs> that was a cool trip, though. Yeah, we we did great. see a lot of stuff. Our, our hotel room looked right at the castle. Oh, uh, and, and a balcony you could sit on and just look at the castle. There was a cool, remember those guys that we thought were going to fight? Yes. So this was right around Christmas time, actually. We actually spent Christmas in Edinburgh. Yeah, we did. Yeah. We did. <laughs> I've and, never been uh, so captivated. I'm like, what, what happens next? Yeah. So, uh, our balcony overlooks this kind of like public space area that has a lot of bars and restaurants uh, that you can go in and out of on foot. And it's very late at night, uh, I think on like December, like, 28th or something. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it's in December. <laughs> There's if anybody fact checks, guys. it's approximate. <laughs> There's a big group of guys drinking just below our balcony, uh, just outside of a bar. And they're, they're having a good time and they're being loud. And uh, we're kind of watching them and stuff. And then coming down on a footpath is another big group of guys. And you can just, they're, they're being aggressive and you, they're, you can tell they're just coming to start shit with those guys that are out drinking and, and messing around just below us. So we're like, oh, yeah, we are going to see some, like, sharks versus jet shit here. <laughs> here we go. So they, like, they march up to each other, and it kind of it feels really aggressive at first. Like, we really, really thought tense. it was going to go down. And then they, what, what song did they sing? They break out in a song it's together. Right. They just start singing. It's like the 12 Days of Christmas. Yeah, it was the 12 like Days that. of Christmas. They just start singing the song. <laughs> Twelve days of Christmas. Like, that was simultaneously like awesome and a letdown. Yeah. Like I'm, you know, like I also wanted to but brawl too. Yes. You know, as you're singing, but oh yeah, that was, was I had so forgotten weird. about that. That was that was crazy. That was good. Like, that's fun. <laughs> Again, pension for violence. We're like, I'm I'm, safe. I'm at a safe distance. I'm nowhere near anywhere that I could get injured. Okay, go ahead, continue. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. We just had good seats. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that was a, yeah. Edinburgh for you, Matt. Mm-hmm. You can't use the same one, so you gotta 
Uh, can you use the same one? Ooh. Okay. And it doesn't have to be with me. You've been to more places than I have. Um, I mean, you're both on the show. We can keep it limited to the... Because <laughs> uh, I've seen some pretty cool stuff in, like, different places, so I'm trying to decide, like, the coolest overall place was. Okay. Um, Amsterdam. Uh, and not for the reasons you think, but partially for the reasons you might think. <laughs> but uh, we got I don't, stranded. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> we got stranded in Amsterdam with the together uh, mm -hmm. with a very small contingent of the Bellator crew due to a freak snowstorm. Um, so here's right. so here was the plan. There was a group of us, <clears throat> uh, just a few, that had decided, hey, we're jumping from Florence, Italy, to uh, Newcastle. Okay. Uh, and hey, if we take this one flight, we can have a 12 hour layover in Amsterdam. We can go out, see the city, you know, have a good time and then go to Newcastle. Perfect. We get to Amsterdam and we land in front of, and like in the middle of like what apparently was the biggest snowstorm they had had in over a decade. Oh my God. And, uh, the entire airport basically shut down. And we were told, yeah, good luck getting out of here. This was uh, this was a Saturday. They were like, good luck getting out of here before Monday. And we were like, holy smokes. So luckily we were there nice, with nice one of the... Nice choice of words. Yeah. <laughs> right. uh, luckily we were there with one of the higher-ups at Bellator who basically had an unlimited corporate credit card. So we just went into the city and, uh, you know, we got rooms uh, for everybody. We got a room together and yeah. everybody else got their own room in the city. Uh, before all the other people from the airport could even make it out. Uh, so we got great rooms right on the canals. <clears throat> and then we just spent the weekend in Amsterdam with the Bellator crew. We had our, our photographer, Lucas Noonan, was with us. So he took all these amazing pictures. Yes. I think I've and, seen those. And I love Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. huge pictures. Yes. Yeah. But while we were there, we had this, like, crazy Norman Rockwell moment. Yes. So uh, we're sitting in this uh, coffee shop, a regular coffee shop, not a special coffee shop. And I like, it's I like the clarification. <laughs> yeah, well, in Amsterdam, you have to, but it's yeah. snowing, and right across the street from this coffee shop is this, like, big churchyard, mm -hmm. um, and it's got a Christmas tree in it that they have the lights on, and uh, out of nowhere, like, the townspeople from Amsterdam show up and start building snowmen in this churchyard, like, straight out of a Norman Rockwell painting. Oh, my God. And then, like, so then we went out and started building snowmen, too, and, like, playing with, like, the Dutch people and, like, having snowball so fights fun. and, like, just playing, like, kids out in the snow with, like, these people in Amsterdam on, like, Christmas. It was yeah. crazy. Like, yeah, that would probably be the, the coolest spot. And, I mean, that Everybody's just... Nice. That's amazing, like, though. Like... Yeah. It's a, it's a, it was a we, we ended up in this one bar where that guy was a huge kickboxing oh, fan. Yeah. So th there weren't very many places open because of the snowstorm, but this mm -hmm. one bar that did serve food was open, and there was literally no other customers in there. So we go in, and he recognizes somebody in our group. I can't remember who. And he turns out he's this, like, huge glory uh, kickboxing fan mm -hmm. and, he, like, knows a bunch of our fighters in Bellator. So then we were just in this bar for, like, three hours just shooting the shit with this bartender who had no other customers, yeah. you know, <laughs> in Amsterdam Drinking talking about kickboxing. <laughs> yeah. You travel halfway across the world. You still end up talking about work stuff. <laughs> no, you can't get Always. away from it. That's why you got to love what you do. <laughs> and, and I think that's the biggest part of it is that you genuinely love what you do. Every conversation we've had, there's never been a time where you're like, nah, you know, you could tell me, you know, all right, I got to go out for 16 weeks, be back for five days. You wouldn't be happy about it, but you'd be like, I get to do what I love. So talk about oh, how yeah. amazing that is on a day to day, especially, you know, in a time like now where we're not having fights. I can't have it. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, you know, there's very few cut men that actually do it full time. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> most of them, kind of like what you said earlier, have like side gigs. Um, I'm the only one of my crew that does it full time. Mm -hmm. Everybody else has something else that they do. That's mm -hmm. European and and American crew. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm lucky in that. There's a few of the UFC cut men that can do it full time as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm I'm exceptionally lucky, even within a lucky subset of people, you know. So it's like it's great to be able to to be a cut man at Bellator, but to have that be the only thing that you do, like that, is really like like cream de la cream, you know, sort of a situation. So you know, <clears throat> for me, it's just trying to recognize that and and realize that I'm pretty 
I'm pretty damn lucky and I better work really, really hard to make sure I stay lucky. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like I want to keep it. So I'm going to work even harder now that I have it. Cause I don't want to let it go. No, so and, and to that's, me, you said that's, making the most of the opportunity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. I, I mean, I, I couldn't live with myself if I ruined this in some stupid way, which would be exactly what I would do, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> and like some stupid way, it would just piss me off because like I, you know, I, I need to be grateful on behalf of all the other people that don't get to do this too. It's kind of like, uh, like Lebowski, like he's out here, I'm taking it, I'm out here taking it easy for all you sinners, you know, <laughs> and I'm grateful for the opportunity. I think it's hilarious that you brought that up because we, we have a local brewery that's actually still open uh, for to-go orders only. Um, mm-hmm. So shout out to Still House in Palm Harbor of all places. Um, <laughs> but one of the guys there was like, yeah, I've never seen The Big Lebowski. It's Is it a TV show? What? And it I should went, be. I got a little offended, and I said, up until a few years ago, probably about six, I hadn't seen it either. Because it's the moniker of it is that it's a stoner movie. Like, that's just what yeah. the yeah. outside look. I mean, it is, but it's not. Yeah. But that's like, what it was looked at as. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And then I watched it, and I'm like, this is amazing. Yeah. The people yeah. who were in it flee jumping in there like, as one of the nihilists. Just, you know, and it honestly took me a few watchings to, like, really appreciate it, like, yeah. completely. And you have to take you know? that in. <clears throat> yeah, because every time, I think even now, every time I watch it, I'll still find something new, some little, some little thing in the background you know, that I didn't notice before in the house or, or something that he's wearing or somebody else is wearing, yeah. you know, I'm like, ah, Maybe shit, does. see, here we are, like, 400 times later, I'm still catching stuff. <laughs> and that's, you know. that's the beauty of that movie, so, but it was so funny, because I went, I, I can't believe you've never watched this. Like, how, how is that possible? So it was hilarious that you would bring that up after a conversation <laughs> I had yesterday. <laughs> um, one of the things a lot of people, if they follow you guys on social media, you guys also train together. Um, yeah, so yeah. obviously it sounds like Matt, you started first. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. but we've, we've trained together, uh, for a, a long time, actually. Yes. Um, I started in martial arts, uh, when I was 12 with Taekwondo as most American kids do. <laughs> and I got my black belt in Taekwondo, um, <clears throat> way too fast <laughs> as American <laughs> kids do. Uh, and then I wrestled in high school and I boxed golden gloves in St. Louis and uh, then I, I saw this thing called the UFC, <laughs> UFC <laughs> one. I begged my mom to uh, give me the pay-per-view because I saw the ad in Black Belt magazine. You know, oh, there God. are no, yeah, yeah, that's how old I am, <laughs> kids. <laughs> uh, so I, uh, I was like, I need to learn jujitsu and there was no jujitsu. Uh, so judo and high school wrestling kind of took the place of that for me. And then I didn't train again for quite a while after that mm-hmm. uh, to join the army and everything. <clears throat> and then I picked judo back up again first. And then uh, I started cross training judo and Muay Thai. And uh, then we did Kung Fu. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And around that time, there was this little Hungar Kung Fu <laughs> school. Uh, and I don't know, I just thought Kung Fu was cool, so that I did that. So fun. Yeah, we did that for years. We were on the lion dance team yeah. together, uh, which is where, you know, the big the big lions in the yeah. street and the yeah. firecrackers like, and everything. Yeah. So I we know exactly where that is. <laughs> we met David Carradine doing that, yeah. actually. Uh, he came to one of our lion dances, and he was high. Oh, he was up. I remember he, he walks up to the lion, and he gets really close to it, and then he just goes, you're just a big old pussy cat. And then walked away, just like, okay, <laughs> yeah. And then, um, yeah, yeah. and then Aikido, I actually trained in for several years. It was a great situation where I was basically getting privates uh, for the monthly rate. Because when I was the administrator at Mid America Transplant, or the director, sorry, um, <clears throat> there was a place right next to my office that ran these these classes every day at noon in Aikido, and no one ever showed up. And it was literally right next door. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, shit. So I just started going over there every day at noon on my lunch hour and, you know, training. And honestly, Aikido is not exactly the most physically demanding. So I didn't even usually break a sweat. So I was pretty good to go right back to work. 
But uh, I trained that for, for several years, and I actually had to stop training that because the, uh, the sensei there uh, told me that he disagreed with my working in MMA as a cut man because he disagreed Ooh. vehemently with MMA since he was a pacifist. Okay. And so we had to part ways. Uh, but then that's when we found Mike Roger at mm -hmm. St. Charles MMA, and uh, we started training jiu-jitsu, both yeah. of us. And now we're, uh, we're three-stripe blue belts now. <laughs> well, it's it's funny that you went that route because there was actually stuff you just told me I didn't even know. The Golden Gloves thing was a surprise for sure. Oh, you can't be you can't grow up in St. Louis and not do Golden Gloves <laughs> a little. <laughs> like it's a it's an institution uh, yeah. in some of the communities there for sure. It's <laughs> funny to me because you know I started watching MMA in two thousand eight two thousand nine. Like that's when I first got into it. You know, I had a buddy I work with. He was actually on my last episode. And he, we would go over to his house, and we would watch Pride for like six hours straight. Yes. And he would just go, no, nope, no, nope, next fight, next fight. No, 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 okay, watch this, watch this. And he would show me this stuff. And I remember I was never, I was never athletic. I was never any of this stuff. But this appealed to me in a way. Probably eight years into me covering it, my dad mentions that as a kid he did judo. And I was like, you're just now telling me this. <laughs> like, what, how do I not know this? And then, you know, over the years, um, I started to train just because I started to understand it. You know, you'd watch a fight and go, why can't, why isn't he moving? Why doesn't he get out of it? And then I did like three or four jujitsu classes and I went, oh, that's why. Because that sucks. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, and I well, up, you can tell, uh, like a filthy casual, they're like, oh, just stand up, bro. Okay, you don't even know. Yeah, that guy looks like he's the heaviest person I've ever had, like inside control is a little 145 pound, like, mm -hmm. like you, like, he's so light. Alex Inland, uh, he's a black belt at Leeds Academy in, in England. His side control literally almost made me throw up. At, and he's like, I'm 40 pounds heavier than him. And I was about to hurl <laughs> with this guy's side control. You know what I mean? Like, it was, it was intense. Yeah, so, well, yeah, they, it's a, it, it, you hit the nail on the head. Size doesn't matter in this. Exactly. You know, in my, I actually had my professors on one of the last episodes. It was episode four. Um, you know, the one who's been there with me from the beginning, who has literally been like, since I met him, come train come train, come train, yeah. come train. And I finally, in the last last year, I was like, you know what? I finally have a job where I can do this. I finally have the time. You know, let's do it. And then fast forward probably six months later, my almost four-year-old nephew, my sister wants to put him in karate. And she's like, well, it's $280 a month. Holy damn. And I'm damn. like, he's three. Yeah. So I said, bring him to jiu-jitsu. And she's like, where? And I was like, Newport Richie Jiu-Jitsu. I'm like, that's where I go. That's where I... I'm like, I trust those people. From class one to class two, he learned takedowns. Yes. Like three and a half. And his behavior got better. Um, when he gets on somebody's back, he's the smallest kid, in the, one of the smallest kids in the class. When he gets on their back, he literally stays there. They can't shake him off. <laughs> and it was so it was so amazing to see that. And then, you know, of course, this year, I'm like a three-stripe white belt because I finally, like, committed to it. I was going to compete. You know, I was ready to be like, yeah. And then yeah. the world shut down. So I'm still going for blue yeah. belt 2020. Yeah. All right. There you and go. I, you got it. And one day we will have to roll. You're not that far. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh... – yeah, our uh, our gym has been good during this. Yeah, um, they've been great. We were we were man, I was starting we were starting to sniff pretty hard around purple though, and now like that ain't going nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not trying to put the car over the horse. But oh, it was yeah. like we were kind of thinking sometime this yeah, year. Yeah, we were like this year we can this, this year, year we were gonna get there, and, and then maybe, but I don't think, I don't so, think so now so. though. <laughs> so what? And I, but we we've been you know we're lucky we get to roll together. We're here yeah. together in quarantine. We can roll. We have space. Yeah. You know, and, and that's been really lucky. But our gym was good about this. Uh, they just shut down payments. They didn't even, it wasn't a question. They just said, nobody's wow. paying until we buy. Yep. Yeah. Like, they, he just sent an email to everybody and was like, nope, done. Like, don't even worry about it, guys. And, uh, yeah, we've been just training here ever since. Really taking advantage of the stuff that's been coming out, like uh, like uh, the, the videos that, like, Dan and her put out and stuff like that, mm -hmm. too. Well, again, <laughs> YouTube. 
Like, right, exactly. Well, and we we have um, oh, shit, I can't remember. Grappler's Guide. Grappler's Guide. <laughs> yeah, we we did one of the Christmas specials, so that was on sale for like seventy nine bucks or something for a lifetime membership. Ooh. And I'll tell you, that has been invaluable. Even like when I could train regularly, I I often went to Grappler's Guide mm-hmm. to like get extra little like tips. Mm-hmm. But now, like they they put up so much extra stuff. They just put up a new yoga program too. Yes. Yeah. So. It's awesome. I may yeah, have to I'm, check it out because I'm I'm getting sir crazy. Um, I yeah. live on the second floor and it's wood floor, so I'm not doing any rolling. <laughs> like, oh, Check out the yoga though; like it'll help you yeah. at least stay like limber, you know. Yeah, yeah. we we got bikes. Running. We've been doing a lot yeah, of running. We've been, running. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've been doing these virtual races. She just which what's the race you're doing right now? Uh, the Cheshire Cat. Cheshire Cat. Yeah, they each have themes. And you get a medal when you finish, but they're all very long. Like uh, they're at your own pace. So I've been logging usually between three and four miles a day, but like the races are like sixty miles long, mm-hmm. and so you just you know it kind of gives you that that motivation yeah. to to go out there every day and like gain some progress towards that. And then when you finish, they send you a medal like you would get like from a five k. Yeah, and they're nice. Really? They're, nice. Yeah, they're actually really good <laughs> yeah. quality. I was surprised. Go, go get one. Gonna... Go get one. Go get one. Oh, uh, yeah, come grab that. Thorn. I like okay. how you both got up. You're like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you're like, yeah, bye. Uh, like they're heavy. Like they're like this one that I'm about to show you is like it's probably a couple of pounds. Like like at least a pound. Oh my like, god. Like, like, this. like it's. Oh my god. Like it's legit. Like it is a heavy metal. Like it's. it's, like, it's, it's it's to anybody at home that trains, it's very equivalent in quality to like a Naga medal, yeah. uh, which are pretty decent style medals. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, this one was for 50.5 miles. And as you're running them, it tells you like, okay, you're running a virtual race in Iceland. So as you're running, you can actually see the road, the 50 miles that you're running on in Iceland, which is what I did for this one. Mm-hmm. Like you can get pictures on Google Maps and be like, oh, this is where I, I stopped today and like look around, which is kind of cool. Wow. Well, and that's one thing about you. I know there was a time where you were bulking up and there, yeah, was, there was a lot yeah. and you, I was power lifting heavily for quite a while. So what uh, changed? Like, why did, what, like, cause it was a dramatic change. Uh, you know, I just, I was starting to have like pain in my hips and my shoulders. Uh, I was snoring. Um, it would just, it was obvious that, you know, while, I was getting very, very strong. It obviously was not what was healthiest for my body. Mm-hmm. So I just... He was having a hard time with, like, jujitsu. He would gas after, like, just one or two rounds of rolling. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he was like, I gotta... He's like, I gotta do something about this. Yeah. This isn't working. I was like, I can't compete in heavyweight at 5'8", you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I gotta I gotta drop down here. These dudes are seven feet tall, yeah. you know? <laughs> you know, because I was at 225 at my, at my, my bulkiest there. And now... Um, I'm at like 170. So, yeah. you know, I mean, it looks fair. good. Like, let's be honest. Like, it looks good. Like, look yeah, good. I'm a lot weaker, though. Like, trust me, there's things I used to be able to do in Jiu Jitsu, like, he's, just like get the fuck off me that I can't do now. You he's know? still so. really strong, though. He, he is. Well, so strong. And everyone you talk to, it doesn't matter if you're a white belt all the way up to black belt, they'll always be like, I'm not that strong. And you're like, I can't get you off me. <laughs> like, you, you're a lot stronger. And then, you know, I'm, I'm heavier than I've been in a while. And it's not, it's not good, but. I started to use it in jiu-jitsu. Right now. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but starting to use it in jiu-jitsu where you're like, they're like, listen, use your weight. Yes. And when I started learning a little bit better how to do that, like it makes people uncomfortable. That's what, yes. honestly, that's that's one thing that it took her a while to learn, it I It did take say. me a long time. And I still struggle <clears> with it sometimes, like really kind of letting letting myself put all of my weight on somebody and really pressure somebody. Like I'm getting pretty good now at like shoulder pressure. Yeah, she is. For a oh, long God, time, I, I really shoulder pressure. <laughs> like it just felt like such a dick sticking my shoulder in somebody's throat and, you know, pushing and their head aside. It's hard to, it's been hard to uh, convince her throughout the years that it's okay to like, you know, choke your partner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, that's what we're here for. Listen, but she go go plotted me on was that Thursday? Tuesday. Tuesday, last Tuesday. She fucking go go plotted me. I was like, I was like out, like, oh damn, I'm gonna die here today. Like, this is how I go out with Corona from a go go plotted by my wife. <laughs> so, I mean, that wouldn't be a terrible way to go. Yeah. <laughs> like Jesus. He died on his shield. Yeah. After, you know, choked him out. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <Very> but, brave. <laughs> but that's amazing that you guys get to share that and you get to do that. And during all this, you know, you're following yes. the guidelines, you're following everything else. And, you know, knowing we all live in Florida, you know, with Florida reopening back up, you still have that chance to go, yeah, look, I roll. I hope everybody who hears this eye rolls um, because this is May 4th and it'll probably come out next week. So um, (laughs) how important is it for you guys to have that community between each other and how much do you miss training with everybody else? Mm. Obviously we miss training with everybody else, but um, we've been saying kind of this whole time, we're just so happy that we're quarantined with each other because we're, I mean, not only are we husband and wife, but we're also best friends. We were friends before we started dating. Mm-hmm. So, like, I'm just happy that I get to be stuck in the house with my best friend. <laughs> yeah, I feel bad for people that are stuck in the house, like, with people that, you know, <clears throat> I, I saw somebody, I think it was on Reddit uh, the other day in, like, the comments section of something. They wrote, you know, a lot of marriages are really only for a few hours every night, you know, on the weekends. And I was like, wow, you know, a lot of these people really don't do only interact for a few hours a day at most. And then Mm -hmm. they're asleep. And, you know, I I think that a lot of people are finding out that that they had a lot to discover about the people they're in quarantine with. Mm -hmm. And I think people that's going really, really well for and other people that's unfortunately not. I feel bad for those people because what are they supposed to do about it? You know, they, you know, just got to muddle through. Yeah. And uh, God, if there's a kid involved too, I mean, we're also like thankful not to have kids right now. <laughs> I've heard, like, I can't even lie to you about that. <laughs> every phone call they have, they're like, do you have kids? I'm like, no, they're like, yeah. they're like, you're lucking out right now. And I, I get it, but I think you're right. And you touched on a really, you know, close to home because I was still working in the office up until about a month ago. And I didn't mind it because there were six people out of 50 at the office. So there was only six of us. We were far away because mm-hmm. I was keep work here, keep home here, keep it separate. But yeah. I didn't realize how great it is to work from home because now working from home, I set up this like I never would have had the recording studio. I never would have taken the time to do mm-hmm. that. You know, my girlfriend works nights as a nurse. I'm able to get up, go make her, you know, something to eat right after work. So I literally log out go do something. And I said, this is great. And I said, all these years I fought it, I fought it, I fought it, I fought it. And I was like, I hope out of this comes, like you said, a newfound appreciation for what you have and to spend more time together because that's what it was. When I had an hour plus drive home, what do we have? Two hours, three hours tops. And then maybe a week. So yeah. So you guys really are lucky. So that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, once again, in the right place at the right time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, to even further add to that, we had actually, in December, bought a, a, a case of masks off of Amazon for like $9 yep. because we were traveling to Japan for all that show. And we know that over there, it's more culturally appropriate to wear a mask. And so just to be a little bit more like, you know, friendly to the culture. And with a lot of air travel during yeah. flu season at the time, mm-hmm. I, we were just we were We'd already bought masks and a bidet. Yes. Because <laughs> so <they're> awesome. <laughs> yeah, and then boom, the two biggest things are masks and toilet paper. And we just really, we got rid of the need for one and stocked up on the other one. I was like, man, if that wasn't great timing, I don't know yeah. what was. I, again, it's I'm still I'm still blown away that toilet paper is was the thing. I know. Like, you know, I, and it's still, it's still unavailable. Yes, like, I figure, like, okay, you have it? to realize, like, the hoarders have stopped hoarding toilet paper, I thought. So why is it still out? That's what I don't get. It's still out. Uh, I had to go to Publix. We had, we've been mostly having our, glo- our groceries delivered. Which is the greatest uh, thing ever. Day, yeah, right. agreed. <laughs> uh, but the other day I did actually go in person, wore the mask, did everything. And, uh, fuck, I remember. Oh my God. Toilet, <laughs> paper, toilet to paper. Well, you didn't. Oh, toilet paper. paper. Yeah. So I, I just I went in that aisle because they had the directional shopping there, uh, yeah. where you can only one direction on each aisle. And I so I'm just going down all of them, and I go to that aisle, and it's still completely bare in Publix. The entire there was the only paper products other than paper plates was one four pack of of uh, paper towels. That was it. No Kleenex, no toilet paper, no other paper towels or anything like that. No, I didn't even need it. But I was in that, that aisle uh, just to keep the directional thing going correctly. 
and people get uh, really was, mad when you don't do that by the way <laughs> like if you're just like yeah, your stuff's yeah. on the end of it they want you to go all the way no 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 go all the way yep. down Around. And that's yeah. what we did. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, it's like, well, oh, okay, yeah. all right. See so, what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's weird. You know, and then they have all the, the barriers up uh, mm-hmm. in front of the cashier now in there, too, which I thought was interesting because that's it's like not in front of where you want to step over to pay. And so it's in, so it's between me and the cashier as she's ringing my, my groceries up. But to get to the, like, the pin pad, I have to step to the side where there is no barrier. So I'm still looking right at her. And then the bagger just screw that person. Like no barrier for the bagger. (laughs) (laughs) Like you, you get the Rona. Like cashier, (laughs) like there's a class system here and cashiers are the billionaires of the grocery store. (laughs) They get barriers. I think we made it an hour without actually saying Corona and you just did it. (laughs) Damn it. Uh, (laughs) Damn it. Um, No, and it's just, the world is going to be a different place. I think the world will be more sanitary after this. And that's what I really hope, you know, especially training, you know, yeah. I'm, mm-hmm. you know, I've been to gyms that aren't that clean. Yeah. It happens. yeah. And you've been to gyms where you're like, did you clean this like 30 seconds ago? Like, is it? We're lucky that one of the reasons we chose this gym when we moved here was because like they had They're such an impeccable clean. cleanliness They're policy. So clean. it's like amazing. it's ridiculous. <laughs> and I was like, that's yeah, that's the spot. Yes. Remember, everybody, so. wash your geese every single time. And your yes, belt. And your belt. And your belt. Wash your belts. You're not going to wash out the knowledge. And if your stripe comes off, put it back on. It's not magic. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> Listen, I may have gone a little bit without washing my belt because I didn't want my stripes to come off. <laughs> it's okay. Just put it back on. If you're really worried about it, anybody at home, if you're really worried about it, Put a little super glue in the area where it overlaps, and it won't it won't come off in the wash. I promise. So that's all you have to do. So pro tip. Pro tip. Pro tip. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, one inch white athletic tape. Uh, take a strip, tear it in half, and now you have stripes for your belt. That's all it. That's all it is. Listen, now you're gonna have people come back and be like, "I'm a three stripe blue belt." Be like, "Weren't you a white belt uh-huh. before?" No, no, no! I watched well, this video. I took saw... university online during yeah, the quarantine, I myself. <laughs> and I'm a brown belt now. <laughs> I'm I'm most excited to get back in there because I do miss that, and I know the first class is probably going to be the worst night of my life, <laughs> the first yeah. night back. Yeah. But, that's... but everybody is going to have that, and that's that's the thing. At least we're all going to suck together, okay? <laughs> because that's such a weird no, place. It's just. We're all gonna gas. And Just keep the keep the trash really cans fine. near the mats for the exactly. people that are gonna throw up because they're gonna happen. Okay, it's like all going back to white belt again. <laughs> I still have you not know. thrown up as a white belt. I've gotten close. But... Yeah. Oh, I did many many times. Many, many times. <laughs> I I I admit though I have a, a bit of a weak stomach. Anyway, yeah. it doesn't wait, wait, take. Wait. My... You have a weak stomach. Doing what you like, for, like yes. whenever I get like overexerted, like I, I'll, I'll throw up. Like it doesn't like like specifically overheated. Like mm-hmm. I am like Stevo with that shit. I just start going. Like uh, in the yeah. middle of the summertime, if it's like August and I'm doing runs around here and that humidity's at ninety percent and it's one hundred and three out. Like yeah, by the end of a five k, there's a fifty fifty shot. You might see me crossing the line blowing chunks. Okay, yeah. <laughs> like it's just gonna happen. So we went running for our very first date and he threw up. I threw up. I threw up on our first <laughs> date. Yeah, we went for a run and I threw up. I forgot about that. Yep. You're right. That was how I knew she was the one because she wasn't grossed out by it. She just came over and laughed at me and helped me up. <laughs> and I was like, nice. Okay. That's the one. <laughs> I mean, that's as good a story to end as any. Like, yep. <laughs> right, right place, right time. And you had somebody who wasn't grossed out by you blowing chunks. Absolutely. <laughs> So, so I, it was chow hall food too. It was. It was gross. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that mental image. I really appreciate it. You, you pictured it perfectly, I'm sure. <laughs> so I'm gonna hit you with one last one. What is the worst moment you had as a cut man as far as seeing an injury up close? And I think I know the answer to this, where you saw something and you were like, Oh my god. Cyborg. Cyborg in London when MVP put that knee right to his head. I thought he was dead. Like, I walked over and I saw the injury and I was like, if he's not dead, he's going to have permanent brain damage at least. The indentation was the size of a softball. 
it looked like a softball would fit perfectly inside where his forehead was. Oh. And I heard that in the arena. It was clear as day. It sounded like a home run in Yankee Stadium. It was a crack. And I was just sure that I had seen my first person die in the cage. I was 100% sure. Wow. Like, yeah, that scared the shit out of me. You know. He's fine. <laughs> yeah. And it was one of our first international shows, too. Like, yeah. one of our very, very first ones. So that was additional it was pressure. Scary. On yeah. yeah. So Very scary. I don't know. What's yours? What's yours like? You seen one where you're like, I don't know, maybe when Rampage <laughs> almost fell over on you. Right? <laughs> okay, I got to hear this. <laughs> Trying to hold him up. Yeah. And then he was confused as to what day it was and what year it was. And I'm like, oh, man. Uh, he uh, he looked at her, like, because he, he knew who she was. He'd actually been flirting with her all week. Yeah. Well, because yeah. he, he didn't realize we were married. <laughs> and uh, uh, he looked at her and he realized, oh, shit, the cut man. And he looked at her and went, oh, shit. Yeah. Like he knew what had yeah. happened. Once he saw her looking at him, he was like, "Oh shit!" Like, "Oh shit!" Like, what happened? <laughs> that's, so yeah, that was that was pretty crazy. That's pretty funny. I thought it was going to be the nose blow. I really did, but I forgot because yeah. I I blocked it out of my mind that cyborg. Yeah, yeah. Oh. the nose blow was bad, uh, but cyborg, like, uh, like still today, like I get goosebumps sometimes when I when I remember it. Like, oof. Oh. I think I'm just going to randomly call. send you that video. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. What's this? I, I, really, I really remember the sound. I think that's the part that really gets me. I remember the sound. Go back. If, if anybody listening, go back and uh, check out the x-rays. They're pretty widely available online. But his uh, his scans from, from that fracture are, wow. It's crazy. It is something to see. Yeah. That's insane. Well, that's as good a time as any to end. So... <laughs> Thank you for your time today, you guys. That was a lot of fun. And I love that you guys went down some memories that you not necessarily forgot, but you were like, hey, I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's always good. So obviously the ticker at the bottom, epicjitsies.com, promo code Quigs. I've got the shirt on. And actually, I need I need your addresses again afterwards because I have something for you. Ah, thank so you. I will I will send that over. But I really appreciate it, you know, on behalf of Combat yeah, Press, of the Quigging Out MMA podcast. If there's anything yeah. you want to tell anybody what to do um, as far as, you know, following the dream, like, what do you have to say to them? Be ready when the opportunity comes. Yep. Plain and simple. You know, <laughs> you know it's, it's as simple. The, the, the more you sweat in training, the less you bleed in battle. You know, it's right down to there. Be ready when it Be comes. Ready. Perfect. So thank you, guys. Stay tuned. Thank you. And...